Okay, um, our next speaker, Gretchen Hoffman, in her paper, describes the dilemma that catalogues in practice face. Among her many interesting questions she asks is value and efficiency over customization and ethical cataloging practice. Who's responsible for meeting users' needs and cataloging? And should cataloging practice be more proactive in understanding users and customizing bibliographic records? Gretchen is an assistant professor at Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas. She's just finished her first year as an assistant professor, and she doesn't mind telling us that she's uh, questioning her sanity. Gretchen graduated in May 2008 from Emporia State University. Her dissertation research focuses on how academic catalogs and cataloging units negotiate the pressures to adhere to standards and to meet users' needs. Her professional experience includes working as a document serial cataloger at Portland State University and as an origin original cataloger at the University of Kansas, focusing on German language monographs, music scores, sound recordings, and special cataloging projects. Gretchen actually enjoys cataloging and teaching cataloging, although one of her colleagues told her she was too well-adjusted, quote-unquote, to be a cataloger. When she finds spare time, Gretchen could be found drinking coffee or wine and avoiding her computer. Please welcome Gretchen. and will make suggestions for a more ethical approach to helping users in cataloging. 
Um, to begin, I'm going to talk about just a general survey of the user cataloging. I'm going to talk about the principle of uh, user convenience, then users in, in uh, cataloging research and standards, and finally users in cataloging practice. So first of all, I'll talk about the principle of user convenience. Focusing on users and meeting their needs is an ethical principle and an informed charge of cataloging. The task of cataloging primarily is to develop and apply standards to create bibliographic records that describe and provide access to information packages. Although cataloging is concerned with applying standards, cataloging has long emphasized and talked about users. The emphasis on the user is called the principle of user convenience. It originated with Cutter, so I'm mentioning Cutter, <laughs> it was. Um, who instructs catalogers to put the convenience of the public before their own needs. It also is reflected in Haken's assertion, the reader is the focus in all cataloging principles and practice. The principle of user convenience is included in the most current statement of cataloging principles called the Statement of International Cataloging Principles, published this year in final form. This document says that the convenience of the user is the highest principle in the construction of cataloging codes, and that decisions should be made with the user in mind. The principle of user convenience is beneficial because it places users at the center of cataloging and instructs catalogers to keep their users in mind. It gives catalogers freedom and power to adapt standards to meet local users' needs and helps them adhere to their code of ethics. Although cataloging talks about users, about meeting users' needs, and the principle of user convenience is beneficial in this way, meeting users' needs can be very difficult in practice. The principle of user convenience only directs catalogers to, quote, think about users. While cataloging, there is very little guidance on how to apply the principle in practice. The principle of user convenience assumes that catalogers can objectively determine users' needs and just know how to customize bibliographic records to meet these needs. You'll just know how to do it, right? No big deal. Thinking about users while cataloging seems beneficial, but what should catalogers actually do to meet users' needs? Catalogers and cataloging departments are left to create in-house policies or rely on their own judgment. In addition, the principle of user convenience assumes a single user group. Olson argues that the principle of user convenience assumes that users are a homogenized group that have similar needs. In reality, the users of a library catalog are a heterogeneous mix of different users with different needs and they are becoming more global every day. How are catalogers in practice supposed to meet the needs of a diverse and increasingly global user base? Now I'll talk about the users in um, cataloging research and standards. The principle of user convenience is beneficial because it instructs catalogers to think about the users. It is problematic, however, because it does not provide guidance on how users' needs can or should be met by catalogers. Uh, another difficulty for catalogers is that cataloging research and standards do not generally focus on users. This is especially problematic given the current paradigm in LIS, which is a user-centered approach to research and practice. LIS started to move toward a user-centered approach, uh, user-centered research and practice in the late 60s and 70s, with contributions from researchers such as Paisley, Allen, and Spicek. The most influential contribution has been Durbin and Neelan's call for a paradigm shift in LIS from research that focuses on systems and standards to research that focuses on users. Instead of focusing on systems like the library, the card catalog, the online catalog, um, like catalog standards, etc., researchers and practitioners are called upon to make the user the focus. Researchers are called upon to understand users' information needs and search and behavior, and use that information to then build systems that will meet users' needs. Practitioners are called upon to create services based on users' needs, have excellent customer service skills, understand and respect users' differences, and as Stalker says, work with the user as a person. Despite LIS's user-centered paradigm, cataloging research generally does not focus on users, at least in the way advocated by this paradigm. Cataloging research tends to take a systems approach and focuses on things like the online catalog standards, new technologies, etc. There are also many articles calling themselves case studies that describe cataloging policies, procedures, or special cataloging projects in different libraries. The How My Library Got Good type article. There are quite a few of those in library cataloging. When users, when users are studied in cataloging, they usually are studied in relation to existing systems and standards. Examples include the many catalog use studies that have been performed and research on how users interact with standards, like how do they use LCSH, how do they use DDC. 
Although many cataloging researchers have called for cataloging to take a true user-focused approach in research, cataloging research generally has not done so. An exception is Carlisle's research on how users categorize works. Perhaps because cataloging research is not focused on users, standards have not been developed based on an understanding of users' needs, although many researchers call for this. There has been some change, some change, however, in the standards of subject analysis. For example, the Library of Congress has changed some subject headings and classifications in response to criticism that standards have a marginalizing effect on non-majority users and are biased toward a white male Christian perspective. Um, they're not perfect, but they have responded to some criticism, such by Berman, Olson, Hina, etc. Despite these changes, however, standards remain standard. They are developed to be universal. They are not developed to meet the needs of a wide variety of different users. Yet cataloging still claims to focus on users, and it places itself within this paradigm, LAS's user-centered paradigm. Um, for example, standards and other cataloging initiatives claim to focus on users, but are not actually based on an understanding of users' needs. Um, a good example is the functional requirements for bibliographic records, Ferber. It is a, quote, conceptual model of the bibliographic universe. The developers claim they took a user-focused approach in the development of the model. Yet the chair of the study admits, quote, it did not involve studies of how actual users approach and make use of bibliographic records. Yet it claimed that it took a user-focused approach. How can it call itself user-focused if it did not actually study users at all? Um, this is significant because this model is the basis of the new cataloging rules, resource description, and access. Um, so this idea of user focus is kind of being perpetuated. It's in Perper, now it's in RDA, but is it really there in RDA? Um, this kind of shows how we're still thinking about the user, we still think about it, but what do we actually do to meet users' needs? Um, cataloging standards, again, claim to focus on users, but are not based on an understanding of users' needs that originates from empirical studies of real users. Um, now to talk about users in cataloging practice. If cataloging research and standards do not focus on users, how are users' needs met in cataloging? Instead of standards, I believe that the responsibility to meet users' needs has been placed on cataloging practice. Catalogers in practice are encouraged to customize bibliographic records to meet local users' needs. All cataloging is supposed to be local. Cataloging departments are supposed to develop local policies to help users, and individual catalogers are supposed to customize bibliographic records to meet their local users' needs. This is possible because cataloging is shared among libraries. Excuse me. Many libraries use bibliographic utilities like OCLC's connection utility to share bib records. Theoretically, one cataloger enters a bib record into the bibliographic utility, and then catalogers from the libraries can customize that bibliographic record for inclusion in their own library catalogs. However, this sets up a two-tiered cataloging model in which catalogers must strictly adhere to standards in bibliographic utilities while they're left alone to and encouraged to modify standards and customize bib records for their own libraries. There seems to be an assumption here that catalogers are able to do anything they want on their own library catalogs. You hear this a lot on AutoCAD, the cataloging listserv. I, I hear it all the time in different presentations. You can do whatever you want. Don't you worry about it. Um, encouraging catalogers to focus on users and meet their needs is beneficial because it makes catalogers aware of users, makes them think of their users. On the surface, this model may seem appropriate. It allows standards to be universal and gives individual catalogers and cataloging departments the power to customize bibliographic records to meet those local users' needs. In this way, cataloging can meet the needs of many users. It can satisfy the principle of user convenience, help cataloging adhere to its code of ethics, and helps cataloging be a part of LAS's user center program. I need another drink of water. There's a lot coming up. However, despite the good intentions of this model, catalogers are limited in their ability to customize bibliographic records in practice. Catalogers may not be meeting their local users' needs. For example, in my dissertation research, I performed a multiple case study of catalogers in three academic cataloging departments to understand how they negotiate the pressure to adhere to standards and the pressure to meet users' needs. On one hand, they're told, you must adhere to standards, and on the other hand, they're told, no, 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 you have to meet users' needs. How did they negotiate that? I found in the study that catalogers in these units strongly believe that meeting users' needs is the absolute highest purpose of cataloging. Yet, 
Catalogers cannot effectively customize bib records because they do not know who their specific users are beyond saying faculty, staff, um, and students. And they cannot articulate the user's needs beyond they need to find things on the library catalog. Catalogers also believe that cataloging standards have been created based on an understanding of users' needs. To catalogers, standards represent users. So to follow standards is to meet users' needs. Why would catalogers need to customize a bid record when the standards already meet users' needs? Some customization does happen in these departments, like adding a subject heading if an item is a part of a special collection, or creating an extra added entry for a person affiliated with the university. In general, however, customization for meeting real users' needs may not be happening. In addition, catalogers are discouraged from customizing bibliographic records by cataloging administrators who themselves are pressured to push for more production, efficiency, and quick cataloging. Customization is expensive. It is cheaper and faster to accept bibliographic records as is from a bibliographic utility without doing any costly customization. It is even more cost efficient just to purchase bibliographic records from vendors, which can be automatically loaded into a library catalog without being touched by a local cataloger at all. In my study, catalogers are limited in their ability to customize bib records. Yet they strongly believe that users are the focus of cataloging, and they try to think about their users while cataloging. These catalogers want to be a part of, the, of LIS's user-centered paradigm, and they want to focus on users. However, because they really cannot customize bibliographic records, catalogers and cataloging departments have had to redefine what it means to meet users' needs in cataloging. When I first started the study, I thought it would be standards versus users kind of add ons but really what I found was that it's all bound up together. Standards and users become one thing in a, in a sense. So they still want to meet users' needs. So they can't customize bib records. So they've had uh, to redefine what it means to meet users' needs in cataloging. So they don't customize, but to be user-centered, it means to follow cataloging standards. I meet users' needs by following standards. To perform rush processing requests. So if a user um, an item has been fully processed and the user wants it, they'll go ahead and catalog it and, and send it up. That's one way they show value. They show that they help users. And also just being nice. Being nice to faculty, staff, and students. That is another way that they show that they focus on users. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And it also means moving away from traditional book cataloging and focusing on things that users really want, like cataloging special collections, performing special cataloging projects, and working with electronic materials. All three cataloging administrators I spoke with said that this is a way they're going to show relevance. This is one way that they maintain legitimacy, show that, that they're important to the university and their library. Because if they can focus, get away from traditional book cataloging, and focus on doing those special collections, they can show value. And if they can reach out into the departments on campus and say, hey, we can focus that little collection, or we can catalog that little collection we have, they can show that they have value, and they're important, and they're going to stay an important part of the university and library. So although the current model in library cataloging is to let the standards be standard, and to empower catalogers on the ground to customize bib records to meet their users' needs, this may not be happening significantly in practice. So, so if users' needs cannot be met in practice, and users are not the focus of cataloging research and standards, then how should cataloging help users? I believe this is an ethical question, because if helping users is the highest principle in the library and cataloging code of ethics, how do we fulfill those principles? What is the right way or ways for cataloging to help users? What is the right thing to do? Um, I believe that cataloging needs to rethink and readjust the way it focuses on users. And I would just, uh, I'll suggest a few things, but these are just very small suggestions. I'm not sure if there is any right way or ways to, to do this, but I'll open it up for discussion. Um, first of all, to help users in a more ethical way, cataloging needs to find the right, the right ways to help them. It is tempting to think that the ethical responsibility lies not with cataloging standards, but with library administrators who discourage customization and, book for, and push for quick and efficient cataloging, perhaps that's partly true. However, even if catalogers in practice were given complete authority and power to customize bibliographic records, would they know what to do? There still exists the problem that catalogers do not know their users and do not know their users' needs. 
There is little guidance on how catalogers should help their users, so how can catalogers possibly know how to help users in the right ways? Is adding a subject heading for a special collection or an extra added entry for a person really enough to meet users' needs? Even if customization were encouraged and widely practiced, it is hard to understand how diverse users' needs can really be met in practice. Because catalogers in practice have difficulty customizing bibliographic records, I believe standards must do a better job of understanding users and incorporating their needs. The responsibility to meet users' needs can no longer be placed on practice alone. Placing users at the center of cataloging research and practice would allow cataloging to take steps toward meeting their needs. The standards must find ways to account for various users' needs because it is not happening significantly in practice. In order for the cataloging field to ensure that users are helped through cataloging and to meet its ethical principles, standards must reflect the needs of various users. I believe that if it's done at the standards level, then there's a better chance that it will be reflected in bibliographic records on the local level. This hopefully will move cataloging closer to meeting its ethical principle and responsibility to help users. In addition to focusing on users and research and standards, cataloging also means to define users. What do we mean when we say users? LIS's user-centered paradigm generally takes a cognitive approach to users. The cognitive approach focuses on users as individuals and wants to understand users' information needs and search and behavior. However, the focus on individual users can be problematic for cataloging because it is difficult to account for every individual user in cataloging standards. There is an alternative approach to users called the sociocognitive approach as suggested by Hurland. Unlike the cognitive approach, the sociocognitive approach argues that what goes on in an individual user's mind is not as important as how context shaped the user. Instead of focusing on users as individuals, Ten minutes. The sociocognitive approach focuses on domains or groups of people to understand things like how the domain searches for information and the words and phrases the domain uses. Domains can be various groups of people from broad groups like maybe public library users or specific subject groups like economists, fly fishermen, mothers, etc. Information about a domain could be used to build systems for organization that can meet the needs of each domain. To take this approach in cataloging, would mean to focus on meeting the needs of domains, not individual users, and cataloging could decide how broad they or narrowly it wanted to define a domain. For example, understanding the domain of economics, fly fishing, mothering, motherhood, would allow cataloging to develop systems of cataloging classification that meet the needs of these different groups. <clears throat> Generally, this approach focuses on controlled vocabulary, subject analysis, classifications, such as Hurley and Mai, and also Bates has talked about this. <clears throat> However, I believe that it maybe could be incorporated in standards for descriptive cataloging as well. Descriptive cataloging rules are based on format, but they could be based on domains. This would expand the descriptive cataloging rules so that instead of format or in addition to format, perhaps there are particular rules for domains. And to tell you where I'm kind of coming from about this, um, an exception in my dissertation was music cataloging. There were only a few at each site, but they were very dedicated. And they were better able to define their specific users and their specific users' needs more than other catalogers were. While everyone else would define them as students, faculty, staff, music catalogers would say, oh, the jazz kids are the opera students. And they would also tie it to specific things they did on bib records. Oh, the jazz kids want extra, need extra added entries for every title on a CD because they're looking for specific titles or they need to know the different performers of a jazz ensemble because the jazz performers tend to move around from group to group to group. Um, so they were better able to tie their users to what they did on those bibliographic records. And what was interesting to me is that it's not only coming from professional catalogers with degrees in music, it's also coming from paraprofessional catalogers as well. I was hearing it from people with no music, musical background at all. Um, but this is an area of future research for me because I also catalog music and I have a degree in music, so I wasn't, I had to leave it out because I wasn't sure what was going on or why this was happening. But I do wonder if it is because music scores and to a certain extent sound recordings are a format used by a particular domain, musicians. Notes and other descriptive elements are added to the records just for this particular domain. Perhaps focusing on domains could bring catalogers closer to users and help cataloging meet its ethical principles. One 
Okay. Conclusion. Focusing on users and cataloging research and practice and focusing on users as parts of domains are just two very small suggestions to move cataloging toward a more ethical approach to users. There are probably better ideas out there. And I can't claim to know the right ways to focus on users at all. There is no probably no one or two right ways. Um, I do think it's something we need to explore as a field. Um, however, I do believe that the responsibility to meet users' needs can no longer be placed on cataloging practice alone. Although all cataloging departments should be empowered to customize big records to meet local users' needs, more work needs to be done at the standards level to help users. In addition, there needs to be research into the right ways to help users. If cataloging wants to help users, it needs to change how it deals with users, and there needs to be more research, basically, on how to do that. It is also important for cataloging to be honest with how it approaches users. Cataloging needs to admit that customization is not happening significantly in cataloging departments, and this two-tiered cataloging model really does not help users. To move toward a more ethical cataloging practice, cataloging must stop just thinking about users, just keeping the user in mind, and it must show specific behaviors that meet users' needs. Claims that users are the highest principle of cataloging and librarianship are empty, dishonest, and unethical if not supported by behavior that helps users. Cataloging must focus on users and find the right ways to help them. Only then can there be a truly ethical cataloging practice. Thank you.
the results were equal for both groups, but over half of them did not understand how to read a journal art, journal record, a serial record in the online catalog. So thank you for giving away to find that information for another article. Yes, um, you are welcome. <laughs> my second, my, uh, my, my primary question really has to do with the what is a user. I love your socio uh, Cognitive yeah. 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 approach. Um, I had never thought of that. I've never heard of that. that, that sure. uh, Erie Verland and yet Eric Mine also talk about it. Um, there are quite a few articles. I would Google Erie Verland okay. and go to his list of publications and start reading. But part of what strikes me throughout this entire conference has to do with how we understand users. I, I've heard Cutter invoked quite a few times, but Cutter was really, when he was talking about the user, he was talking about people from a very defined socioeconomic group constrained by a geographical location. We don't have that anymore. So, you know, I, I sometimes I feel when we're talking about the users, we're not recognizing just the basic societal changes that occurred and we're still expecting ourselves to adhere to a model that was established in the 19th century. So um, sometimes I'm wondering if this is really a sustained something that's sustainable. I'm not sure if that makes any sense. If what is sustainable? If saying, well, we're focusing on the user when really because the user has become such a large, essentially the entire world. Um, well, I find myself thinking, it's like, okay, we want to customize for the individual user, but we have to, because of shared cataloging, appeal to a wide variety of individual users which uh, I do like this domain idea. But what really gets me is that doesn't it kind of happen like vanilla is the default flavor? Not that many people really love vanilla, but they don't hate it enough to object to it. I mean, isn't that what our catalog is kind of been reduced to because of this issue of needing it essentially something that could be accessible to the widest part of people? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. What, what is there? Sorry. Hmm? That was a great comment, is, is there? Well, I, I, I'm sorry. Are you trying to answer the No, I don't think you are a user. No, not at all. And I would think the user centered paradigm is something, I think, not in just Catalog, but LMS overall, that hasn't really been questioned. Um, we, we focus on users, we focus on users, but do we really focus on users? Do we really do, do, do things that are really about what the user is and what that means in practical terms? Um, I just wanted to insert a uh, comment into the research discussion. Um, I think it's on the six year list. Alice Carlisle just suggested that we make 2010 the year of catalogs research. Yes. Uh, <coughs> this is an observation based on Richard's talk and your talk, and Alan, about when you talk about the standards for music cataloging. And then you talked about how music catalogs were better able to find specific users. And I don't know if there's a correlation between those two things. I mean, even down with paraprofessionals and to be able to describe better their user groups. Um, but it, it seems like that would be a place to sort of start looking at. It's um, an interesting area of research. I don't know why it is. Dr. Smell, who would probably have a more a better answer for you, but I, I definitely would love to explore that question of why is it that music catalogs are better able, at least in my study, and it could have been just my study. It could have been just that I happened to land in three academic county departments that had music catalogers, and you know what? I think all of them went to Indiana and studied with Ralph. So, yeah, it could be just that it, it or I was a cataloger and I could have been influencing it. I, I don't know why, but I think there is something there. But, yeah, you know, we're extrapolating that to the different groups if there's something in there. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I, I think I have a partial answer to that. Music is something as opposed to astronomy or chemistry that an individual can pursue on his or her own. So that even at a staff level, or paraprofessional level, you can, some individuals will have a certain level of expertise in that, or at least strong interest, such that they can practice it on their own, which they can't necessarily, they don't have a chemistry laboratory, hopefully. 
So, um, so that may that may be a reason for that. They have a, a, a broader and deeper appreciation for music because they're involved in, with it themselves. For what it's worth, I don't think that yours was a skewed result. Okay. Um, I think that and, and I did spend 11 years on CCK, and my observation is that music catalogs <coughs> are both pushier <laughs> and more successful than other specialist catalogs uh, in, in making certain that they retain a certain number of staff involved in their work only. It's there are music catalogers, and then there are catalogers who do anything else. And the, the, the catalogers who do anything else don't have the same concentrated voice. And so um, I think that, that if we are looking at the ability to do quality cataloging for other kinds of materials, we would do well to try to figure out what it is that the music catalogers have been able to do to insist that their area does not get to do to the staff. And I know when I was telling music, I loved it. It's the best cataloging I ever did. I had so much fun every single day, more than any other kind of I've done. I, I think that it's a true culture uh, that surrounds music. If you think about it, people who spend their life uh, scratching on strings and pounding on things and going to the bottom of the face. Uh, to give other people a response. It, it's, it's a true culture. It has its own language, its own uh, habits and customs. And, it's, and they hear from their music. People drop by and ask them questions. So they know the jazz guy and the music guy and the, you know, the African drummer guy and all that stuff. You're right, but I think it's a very tightly close knit culture, and that's why they're more successful. It'd be nice to take that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I hear in, all, in many of the discussions of cataloging that there is this assumption that there's only one record and that one record is going to represent that item worldwide almost, that you can only get this one chance to catalog. And I think that we're moving into a technology where that is no longer true. That we could have different catalog records that represent different users and different viewpoints. You could have the children's record and the public library record and the academic library record and the some kind of specialist record. And that we can find a way to manage those. We don't have to have just one or hopefully soon we won't have to. And I think that will resolve a certain amount of this dilemma because people will be able, I mean, at that point, we're going to have to figure out how we identify, or if we want to identify, the intended target of that catalog record. But at least we'll be able to have a plurality. Absolutely. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you very much. I see that uh, lunch has arrived, um, and so we're going to um, break for lunch. It's um, 20, Mike watched this 20 minutes before noon. How about if we come back uh, about five minutes before lunch?